There's another situation that I'd like to talk about now that you've got some basic electricity under your belt. For years we've had electrolysis problems or corrosion problems and uh, now with electricity, uh, as you know it, it should be much easier to understand. On underground now, we have a particular problem with the concentric neutral. One of the reasons why you see more jacketed cable going in around the country. The big problem with this is that anytime you have dissimilar metals, you have a voltage difference. Each metal has its own electrode potential. If you'll turn to section 4-8, unit 11-10 on electrolysis, on page number four there's a there's a, a table there that uh, gives you the electrode potentials and some people have had a little trouble trying to read that but it gives a lot of your common metals and uh, what the electrode potentials are. Now to give you an idea of, of, of what the electrode potentials represent is hydrogen is used as a standard. In other words, we're saying that any voltage we get on a metal is going to be compared to hydrogen. If I was to put a metal in an electrolyte, uh, water if you will, what will happen, it will immediately try and reach its what we call electrode potential. If, if I was to take a little beaker of water and put this material in, and let's just use copper for example, if I would stick that copper into that water, what would happen, it would go through an oxyreduction process. And what we mean by that is the atoms of material will leave, the ions of material will leave, which is the material itself. Remember that we said an ion was, was an atom that had an either a surplus or a deficiency of, of its electrons. In other words, if it has a required number of electrons, and that should change, then it becomes an ion. If it has a deficiency of electrons, then it's going to be a positive ion. If it has a surplus, it's a negative ion. So what happens here in our material is when the, when the ions of material leave, they leave behind the outer electrons or what we would call the valence electrons or the free electrons that normally orbit around that atom. It will do that until it reaches its own electrode potential and then it will stop. This is really the secret to the whole thing on protection of our underground cable is that if we can satisfy that cable for the required electrode potential we wouldn't have any of this oxyreduction. We wouldn't have our corrosion of our concentric and that sort of thing. Now all metals have different electrode potentials. If I have another one over here and let's just use over in this beaker, let's put a piece of zinc in here and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll put this this zinc in, uh, in an electrolyte and then of course also do the same thing. It'll go through the oxyreduction oxyredu re process. It'll go through the process of uh, releasing these ions, these positive ions into solution leaving behind the, the outer free electrons just the same way copper did. The only thing is the zinc is, a, is more higher on the activity series so that it has a higher electrode potential. Now we're comparing them all, like I say, to hydrogen. And if you'll look on your table, you'll see where zinc has a minus 0.76 for a potential. Copper is actually going the other way from hydrogen and it has a positive 0.34. If I was to compare the two, they both have negative uh, charges on them, 
but if one is more negative than the other, then this will look negative to the copper. So that if, if I was to tie the two together, the electrons are going to want to go over to the copper. Now what happens with the copper is it reaches its electrode potential, so it ceases to go through the oxoreduction process. Now to relate that to our underground cable, our sacrificial anodes, which is a misnomer, it's, you figure, figure anything with a negative charge is going to be our cathode, but anyway, they, they call them an anode. We have an anode that we tie onto our copper. When we do that, when we do that, and uh, I'll show you a picture of that. When we do that, if we tie that to uh, a tank, let's say this is down in an underground uh, vault, if you will. Say we've got an uh, iron transformer tied onto, uh, uh, say, uh, say we're tying our uh, iron transformer onto an anode that is down here in the soil. This is going to be zinc. Okay. When we do that now, what will happen here is this iron is going to be less active than the zinc. This zinc goes through the oxyreduction process. It's sacrificial. It'll supply the electrons to that iron tank, stopping it from going through the oxyreduction process, thus protecting the tank. We get a lot of sludge, weeds, and so on that's stuck down in here, you see where they're in contact with the tank, what we're doing, we're protecting that tank from going through the oxyreduction process. The zinc is actually going up to, uh, the, uh, say the electrons from the zinc are going up and then satisfying that iron tank. Uh, if I put sacrificial anode on an underground cable, say I tie onto that cable and I come down and I put a zinc bar in here like this, Here's our copper, here's our zinc. We've got a situation there where we've got 0.76 potential for the zinc and we have a point plus 0.34 for our copper. That would give you 1.1 volts. If we had a perfect situation between the two, those two dissimilar metals would yield to us 1.1 volts. This is a half cell. You remember in going over our dissimilar metals and uh, the electrolysis and that sort of thing that uh, we could get from our dissimilar metals, we can get a voltage difference depending on where they were at on our activity series. This is what you call a copper, copper sulfate half cell. And if I wanted to test a buried anode, a zinc anode for example, I could use this cell and then connect onto my anode and check to see that that the anode is in good condition. And the way I would do that, I would put this half cell in contact with earth, connect onto my anode, and then I should get, if everything's highly active, I should get 1.1 volt because I have copper here and then of course my zinc buried in the ground, both of them in contact with, with earth. If everything is proper, I could get as much as 1.1. Now that's asking a lot. Uh, the test uh, made on anodes, the requirement to follow your uh, spec, underground spec, is that you would want to get at least, say, 9 tenths or 0.9 volts and then you'd know it was proper. Now this, this little half cell, you could make up one on your own if you wanted to. Uh, take a piece of, uh, say, PVC pipe and uh, make a cap 
uh, use a piece of porous block down below, some kind of porous material that would let this copper sulfate leach through so that it would be in contact with earth, good contact. And uh, all you'd have to do is have a solution with uh, copper sulfate crystals mixed in and then have a copper rod down through the middle and you could test your own anodes. You'd have to use a millivoltmeter, a very sensitive meter, you see, that would read as low as, as one volt, you see, uh, or less than even a volt, and you could check it out. One thing you'll see that uh, if you use magnesium, now magnesium you're going to get, say, about two and a half volts. If, if, you, if you compared magnesium uh, to copper, you would see you'd have a much higher voltage. If you were in an area where you had high resistant soil, sandy soil, and you have trouble getting the action from your uh, anode that you want, you'd probably end up using magnesium anodes instead of zinc. And of course the voltage would be higher on those because of the difference. When you read that activity series chart, what you want to do is read it like a thermometer. You've got uh, a plus values down below and negative values above. What you would do is actually add the two together. Read it like you would uh, temperature difference on a thermometer. In other words, you're reading below zero and above zero or whatever. Uh, you can check and compare from those metals what kind of activity you should have. What will happen now with this situation is that the zinc will supply our concentric on our cable here. It'll supply our concentric with the electrons that it needs so that it won't be active, so that it won't go through the oxygen reduction process. This, this protects your cable. We've had situations uh, on overhead uh, system for years, you know, we just say, well, they're corroded and we'd replace the anchor rod and not think anything of it. Good example of that. How many times have you seen on a say, for example, maybe maybe you've got an A5 here where where you've got copper coming down. You got your your uh, ground rod. You got your 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 copper ground rod over here, and that's tied to your guy. You come over here, and over here you've got your your uh, anchor rod, which is which is zinc. You've got copper and zinc tied together. What happens here? is that this zinc supplies the system. You actually, all your grounds and so on down the line are all tied together. What happens is that uh, uh, this, this anchor rod becomes sacrificial to your copper. And uh, even if I had a, even if I had a strain insulator, some of you probably have that question. Uh, even if I have a strain insulator, I'm still going to have a problem. By not being tight, it's going to operate much faster. It's going to go through a much faster rate of oxygen reduction if, if this was all connected solid here. But even with a dissimilar, uh, say, ground resistance from uh, being wet down below and dry above, I can have the oxygen reduction process taking place here and the electrons migrating up to the top of the rod so I can still have a problem where it'll eat itself off. Probably much slower, but uh, you still have a problem. Now eventually what happens is down towards the bottom it eats, it's, eats it off and then you get your first storm and, and uh, sleet storm and you get extra tension on that and then she breaks loose and, and then you're back there replacing the uh, replacing your uh, anchor. Now somebody in all their wisdom has come up with the idea that if we put more galvanizing to the ground, in other words get rid of the copper rod and uh, go galvanize rod that, uh, that you're going to, to stop. You'll stop that oxygen reduction. Keep all, instead of dissimilar metals, have all your metals the same. Well, that's, that's poor reasoning from the standpoint that regardless of whether, whether uh, you have all metals the same, you're still going to have corrosion taking place. 
And a good example of this, if I didn't have this tied to anything, I'm still, because of the difference in the ground resistance, I'm going to have a corrosion problem. Uh, on underground systems, I've seen this. Uh, somebody, and I can't believe that they had ever recommend this, somebody recommended at one time that you should put galvanized rods in your pad transformers. Uh, of course, that's a da dangerous thinking. Because what's going to happen, it is a sacrificial material. Regardless of, of what situation you've got, that is going to be sacrificial. It is going to disappear on you. It's, it's that, that galvanized, that galvanized uh, rod that you put in there is going to be sacrificial to your concentric. And of course, being sacrificial, what happens through corrosion, it's going to eat itself up. Eventually, then you won't have anything. Your rod will be gone. Your concentric will be gone. Your hot transformer sitting there is going to be just uh, the case is going to be energized. Uh, uh, you know, if you if you've got a situation where you have a, a Y connected transformer, that case is tied to your system. That transformer is going to be hot as your phase wire. So that's very, very poor reasoning. I couldn't believe that the first time I saw that recommendation. Their reasoning behind that was that the more of the same kind of material you get in the ground, the less activity you'll have, which is true. The rate of this oxy reduction that takes place here is at a ratio of your two dissimilar metals. If I have more iron in the ground, I have more iron being sacrificial to the copper, the rate of activity is going to be less, but it doesn't stop. We have uh, applications for this uh, even in the home. Uh, if, if, uh, if you've ever taken a close look at your water heater, you'll see that a water heater is going to be your better water heaters are glass lined. In other words, I'll, I'll have an uh, iron tank and then I've got a fiberglass liner inside that tank. Uh, if that fiberglass liner is good, uh, you know, that tank should last you a long time. If I have a hole in that fiberglass liner, in other words, here's my iron, and then I have, whoop, I'll put it somewhere else, and I have copper coming out of there, you see. Here's iron tied to copper. Of course, what's going to happen now is that that iron tank's going to be sacrificial to your copper and go through the oxy-reduction process because this iron is more active than, than this copper up here. So what they do is, is onto that tank, what they do is they put a magnesium core down inside that. There's a plug right on top there. And tied to the other side of that plug is magnesium. Now magnesium is even higher on the activity series than zinc is. Uh, you're, you, you've got a situation there now where, where this zinc is tied right to the iron this, uh, or I mean this, this magnesium is tied right to your iron. It's sacrificial to the iron. What it does, it eats itself up. And uh, probably lasts as long as your warranty is on your water heater, and then when that's gone, your water heater's gone, but uh, your supplier could care less at that time. But you see how, how they're using uh, dissimilar metals there to even protect your water heater. Now we, on our systems, can have, I, I'm sure this question is probably coming out, you say, well, I know of a situation where, where I've got, uh, say, some cable in the ground and there isn't anything tied to it. And before we could get back, the, the, the concentric was corroded. And that, that can happen. What happens there is you'll have different soil resistances. Maybe, uh, maybe you've got a situation there where, where you uh, have hilly uh, ground and so on. You get your cable plowed in all along here, coming out in both areas. Down in here, it might be wet. 
might even be a slough right in here. It's wet, highly wet. You're going to have a lot of activity in this area. What happens, you'll have a lot of activity here, and then the electrons will migrate over to an area where there's less activity. So you've got all your activity taking place down here, and of course it's going to be, your concentric is going to be eaten up at that point right there. So it's, it's, it's a situation where uh, through this electrolysis you can have an understanding of really what's happening in your cable. Now this is the reason why a lot of people are, uh, are using uh, jacketed cable. There again, now, jacketed cable, you're going to have to be particularly careful with that jacket. Because if you have a situation where uh, you have one uh, small spot that's nicked, where a moisture can get into it, then that'll eat itself off fast. That'll disappear in no time. You're looking at days and maybe even hours where that's going to be completely eaten off just because of the ratio of, uh, of the area. Uh, you, you, you've got a small amount of metal exposed and it's going to eat itself off quite fast. Uh, gas companies have been aware of corrosion problems for years. They, they use their iron pipes, but they, they uh, tape up their pipes. They actually uh, insulate them from the ground so that they can protect them. And then what they'll do, they'll electronically tie protective devices on. They'll, uh, they'll have uh, protection in the form of electronic devices that will electronically supply the electrons to to their uh, to their pipe, and of course the more load if they have some place where it gets nicked, somebody digs into it or whatever, uh, they'll they'll know that they have some problem there. But it protects that iron pipe from from going through the oxidation reduction process. Okay, let's uh, move on in the program.